watching Over the Edge from Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. I'm back with Professor Abraham Loeb of Harvard University. Uh, Dr. Loeb, what, when you say Carrington event and how damaging this could be to infrastructure, we could mitigate that to some degree with Faraday cages, but is there a better way? Is there a more efficient way to protect uh, human civilization from, from an outburst like that from the sun? Well, uh, much of the risk uh, originates from uh, energetic particles that are associated with the flare. Uh, there is some uh, ultraviolet radiation that uh, destroys the, the ozone in the atmosphere um, that is damaging, but, but uh, most of the damage uh, comes from the charged energetic particles flowing out of the sun. And um, uh, in principle, those particles could be deflected away from Earth uh, by introducing a magnetic field uh, that deflects them. And in fact, that's the way the Earth itself protects itself. Um, uh, there, there is magnetic insulation. It, it, it deflects uh, some, some of those particles. And so one can imagine uh, creating, for example, a current loop uh, that is of large scale, the scale of the size of the Earth, and placing it in space uh, between us and the, and the sun in a Lagrange point, such that it will stay there, uh, and uh, generating, uh, I mean, running uh, uh, some, some current in that loop, uh, in that wire, that doesn't need to be very big, but, but needs to be uh, big enough, I mean, wide enough, such that it will not heat up and melt. Uh, through the current going through it. Uh, and uh, by having a current in that loop, one can generate a magnetic field that will be sufficient to deflect all the energetic particles from their uh, trajectory toward Earth. Uh, that sounds um, like a complicated engineering project, but um, it shouldn't, you know, if we eventually realize that it's necessary, it's doable within a reasonable budget. Uh, we, we made an estimate of that. Um, and and uh, another the, uh, aspect of it is that other civilizations may actually uh, have decided already to do that. And so one can search for um, structures around the, in between a planet and its host star uh, around other stars. And if we see any structure, uh, through either because it uh, occults uh, the star uh, periodically as it moves around, or uh, through some other effect, uh, we see the, some evidence for the, magnet, the artificial magnetic field produced by the current loop that I mentioned uh, on the wind coming of the star. You know, that, uh, that could indicate uh, a techno uh, signature uh, that is very interesting to search for. Um, how, another approach which is actually simpler and uh, less costly is to protect our systems. Uh, to have some form of protection or warning system uh, for our power grid and satellites such that uh, they would not uh, operate in a vulnerable uh, environment. What is, uh, now, with asteroid uh, impact mitigation, what, is the, what would be the most efficient method for us to do that? Would it be, you know, vaporizing gases off the surface of the asteroid with a nuclear weapon or something like that? Or would, or would it be better to do it gravitationally by passing other asteroids nearby? What, what is the most feasible method to uh, mitigate that threat? Um, well, potentially both are uh, both methods you mentioned are, are feasible. Um, one interesting possibility uh, is to um, use a powerful laser of the type that I was discussing before in the context of Sarshot, but instead of pushing on a sail, just uh, vaporizing the surface of a, a, an asteroid in a way that uh, gives it a kick uh, with the rocket effect. So basically you, you generate a ste uh, some steam on one side and, and that pushes it uh, sideways. Uh, and that, that is a relatively uh, simple process. Uh, uh, it's, uh, you don't need to explode anything near it. You just shine a laser on it. And if we will have uh, the Starshot laser developed, uh, this could be another application of it. 
So it would be dual use, in other words. It could be, but uh, in principle, one does not need the same power for the task of deflecting an asteroid. It could be a lower, a lower power laser. Um, but, um, you know, obviously, if we do see uh, a killer asteroid on its way to Earth, and we have several decades uh, before it reaches the Earth, uh, there would be much more funding towards uh, uh, various methods of, of deflecting it. Um, and right now, it's just the fact that there is no warning um, that something is approaching that makes most people lax about it. Um, and presumably within a century or so, I mean, we will most likely have the technology to do it relatively easily. So we just have to make it that long, um, <laughs> which in geologic time scales, that's not very much. So not very much. Hopefully, hopefully we'll be safe. As long as, as we behave, um, as long as people are kind to each other. Well, that's the important thing. You, you can't, if you're going to have a civilization that explores a galaxy, it has to last longer than, you know, um, it can't be short term. And right. So, so this is an important lesson to learn from the sky. Uh, if we find that most of the civilizations we discover lived that long because they were peaceful, that would be an important lesson. The question, I suppose, is it, it used to be framed that we would have, as Kardashev thought, where you have type 1, type 2, and type 3 civilizations. Do you think that's, that's a sort of an antiquated view and that maybe civilizations don't really look like that they don't use that kind of energy do you think it's do you think that it's much more subtle than that because it appears to be because of the fermi paradox yeah i i, I think so um i mean part of the reason i think so is because um, uh, transportation or, or or mobility uh is another important uh, ingredient uh, you, you don't want to be stuck on a surface for too long time because conditions change, climate could change, could be an astrophysical catastrophe. Uh, there would be other reasons to move away uh, because you realize that there are some resources you can't find. And so it's all about mobility, about the ability to, to go elsewhere uh, rather than uh, developing um, your home to, to be more sophisticated. And once you think about mobility, then uh, you, you have to carry resources with you. But uh, uh, the way that the civilization would look like is quite different because it might actually fragment into uh, small uh, vehicles, you know, that um, don't produce a, a huge signal each because they're not co-located. They're in different places, might send copies to different places so they any estimate you make for the likelihood of life based on the habitable zone of, of stars is, is not relevant because uh, the advanced forms of life um, produce a lot of copies. And if these copies are self-sustainable, I mean, in the sense they don't need to be close to a star, then all bets are off. We, we don't, and if they're faint enough for us not to see them, then uh, we, we don't really know what's going on right now. And um, it's not about most powerful one, the one that harnesses the most amount of energy. It's about the one that can reproduce itself the most. <laughs> uh, I mean, you, you can see that uh, lesson in nature, right? Uh, if you have a, a relatively small uh, animal uh, like a human uh, that uh, is able to um, think through what it does, uh, it can become the most, uh, you know, the strongest species on Earth, even though there are much bigger animals around. So it's not about the strength. You, you might say, okay, the muscle strength uh, determines who is most influential, but that's not true. It's sometimes about producing uh, copies, about being intelligent enough to survive uh, harsh environments, about being able to evolve to something much better than uh, that gives you. And um, you know, we are still thinking all the time about stars, planets next to stars, such that there could be liquid water on the surface. But that's what nature gives you. And it may not be enough for most the most advanced villages. And, and so they would do things that go beyond what nature gives them. And that's the kind of behavior that we haven't, you know, we are, we are not 
yet able to comprehend because we haven't reached that phase ourselves. And we are just now starting to think about interstellar travel, but you know, eventually we realize that you know there is a lot to it, uh, much beyond what we can currently envision. So, would it make more sense as you know, as the sun ages, its luminosity is increasing, and that's going to at some point be a problem? Um, does it make sense to artificially migrate Earth in the same method you would use to migrate asteroids? You know, just pass asteroids over a very long period of time past Earth to sort of migrate it outward as the sun's luminosity increases? Or would it be better to build a shade? Or would it be better to just um, head to Proxima B? I think it would be best to develop a mobility so that um, instead of moving the Earth, which is a very hot, heavy object, you just move a, a, a spacecraft much smaller and much more feasible uh, um, uh, objective to have in mind. Um, and, and you can propel yourself, um, I mean, to a place that you find more comfortable. Um, and um, then, uh, you know, if you think about the Earth, um, it doesn't do too much good for us except being a, a piece of rock that we can walk uh, on its surface and uh, enjoy the gravity that it provides such that we don't, um, you know, that there is some atmosphere that they, uh, allows liquid water to exist. But if uh, one can create the conditions that we need artificially and uh, travel. And once you do that, uh, you're not restricted to circumstances anymore. Um, it's sort of like um, the difference between living in a cave and, and building a, a highly modern house with uh, all the gadgets that we currently have. Um, uh, obviously, we can create uh, an environment that is much more comfortable uh, if we are not uh, surrendering to what nature gives us. Um, and um, it, it doesn't make sense to actually move this big piece of rock because most of it is completely useless. Uh, we just want the surface to have the right temperature, but why don't we create a surface that has the right temperature and then uh, power it uh, to wherever we want to go? And one could also say that uh, rather than moving Earth, you could build habitats or something like that artificially. You know, right. You know. Or, move, or move to another planet in the solar system. That's another possibility. Terraform uh, Mars, for example, or ter uh, you know, terraform other objects. Um, yeah. That was a bit of material that went over the edge. A bonus clip from a full episode of Event Horizon. New episodes every Thursday. So do be sure to hit subscribe. The full episode should be on your screen right about now. <laughs>